Good afternoon and welcome everybody to today's seminar in sustainable development. We have uh, today, <coughs> my name is Peter Schlosser, I'm the Deputy Director and Director of Research of the US Institute and I will introduce today's uh, moderator of the panel in a moment. Just want to make a few remarks to those of you who haven't been at one of these events. What we try to do with this seminar series is to highlight topics of interest. Usually we try actually to address an issue that has been either in the press or was otherwise uh, timely in the, in the recent past. So today you can see looking at different aspects of climate like extreme events. We had um, Storm Sandy recently. Also the temperature trends for last year have been released and there was some discussion around that. Of course there was the maximum temperature for the uh, United States but also people started to discuss whether or not in the future we will see any kind of further increases or if we are in a plateau, so I'm sure Gavin will, will address some of that. And uh, so given the, the three speakers we have, I'm looking forward to a very uh, stimulating and interesting session. We will have most likely two more events, possibly three, but uh, most likely two. One will be on the Millennium uh, Village uh, project, I think it's April 4th, by, given by Jeffrey Sachs, the director of the US Institute. And then towards the end of April, we will have one session on hydrofracking and all the issues around them. That date still has to be set. So let me introduce now the moderator of today's uh, session, Gavin uh, Schmidt. Gavin is uh, Deputy Chief and a Climate uh, Scientist at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies of NASA, located just a little bit down Broadway here above Tom's uh, restaurant. He has been a frequent uh, com contributor to public communication on issues of climate. He also received for that uh, activity the first climate communication prize of the American Geophysical Union in 2011, if I remember that correctly. He is the co-author of uh, Climate Change, Picturing the Science, which he jointly uh, published with photographer John Wolfe. This was in 2009. And many of you might know him from his activities uh, in the context of realclimate.org, where he was one of the co-founders and is probably the most frequent contributor uh, to date. So Gavin will introduce the panelists and will lead through the session. Please welcome Gavin Schmidt. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, not only to, so to welcome the people who have never been to one of these seminars before, I've never been to one of these seminars before, and so I'm going to break all of my rules about speaking to, uh, to public audiences by having lots and lots of graphs. I apologize in advance. I will try and make it easy on everybody. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about temperature changes uh, over the last uh, few years and, 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 uh, and years to come, why they change, uh, what's going to happen to them uh, in the future. Um, and then we're going to move on to uh, discussions uh, with, on extreme events um, and hydroclimate events with, uh, with Jason and Richard. So what we'll do is we'll just, uh, I'll give my presentation. Um, if there's any very quick questions, we'll take them then. If, uh, uh, but then we'll just kind of switch over to the other two uh, and then we'll have uh, hopefully uh, half an hour or so to, uh, uh, to discuss uh, anything that you care to discuss uh, in a Q&A session afterwards. Okay, so um, what's going on? So this is, uh, this is a picture of, of the temperature anomalies uh, for last year uh, compared to uh, a baseline uh, back in the mid-20th century. Can we see that? Ooh, we can't really see that, can we? Oh, that's better. Yes. Okay. So, double fisting the clickers here. Um, so, w what we do when we're calculating these climate anomalies is that we take uh, a picture of the climate from a period when we had a lot of information, uh, say the mid 20th century, 1951 to 1980. We average the climate over that period, 
Uh, and then we judge whether, for instance, 2012 was warmer or colder than that particular period. So these, uh, these colors up here are, if they're in the oranges and the reds, that means that they were warmer than this average by, you know, the numbers here are around two degrees Celsius. Uh, so that's about just under four degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, this is four degrees, so the reds up here are around uh, uh, seven odd uh, degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than this average, right? So that's, that's quite warm. And you'll see that almost everywhere on this map, uh, it's, it's yellow and, and, uh, and orange and red. So that means that on the whole, the planet has warmed since the, 19, uh, since the 1950s. Uh, and and, you know, and that, that comes up in lots of different uh, contexts. Uh, but it's not uniform, right? This is very important to know. If you just take the, the temperatures for a single year, um, it is actually, uh, there are some places that are a little bit colder than the average. So down here in, in Antarctica, or uh, you know, there's another little part of Antarctica that's colder. Alaska was a little bit colder last year than even in the 1950s, right? Uh, but, but you'll remember that the, the continental US, this got a lot of headlines at the time, continental US had a record-breaking year, and I'll show you another graph that demonstrates that in a second. There's a couple of things to notice that happen, not that, that occur in all these things. Um, you'll notice that the land, you know, this is Africa, South America, America, Europe. The land is more orange and red than the ocean, right? And that's, that's something we expect. We expect that the land uh, to be warming faster than the ocean because basically the ocean has an enormous heat capacity. It takes a lot of energy to warm the ocean, much less to warm the land. Uh, and so as we move into a kind of globally warmed uh, world, uh, the land is expected to warm faster and to stay warmer longer. Um, so this is kind of what it looked like uh, in the annual mean. You see that there is structure. Not everywhere is warm. Uh, some places are warmer than others. But, but overall, you can see that it was quite a warm year. Um, if you just take a single month, right, you see a lot more structure because you're seeing a lot more weather. Right, so this is January, the, the, you know, the last month for which we had data in this particular data set. Um, and you can see that January was very warm in, uh, uh, in, our, part of the, in our part of the world. But there was, you know, the, the, but the California, uh, Washington State was actually quite cold. Uh, and you can see there's a lot more structure. And that's because of the weather. That's because of where the storm systems were, where the jet stream was doing its thing, where the wiggles were. Um, and so you get a sense that as you average over longer time periods, uh, you lose some of that structure, right? So uh, if you average over lots of different months which have different patterns, then you end up with a smoother pattern uh, associated with the mean. If I average that over multiple years, I would end up with a smoother pattern still. If I look at the trends over 30 years, the pattern is smoother still. Um, and so the noise associated with the weather goes down the more I average things in time and space. Um, if you put it all together, and you just get like one number for a single year, you end up with a picture like this. So uh, this is the, uh, the data that goes from uh, the, the late 19th century up to 2012 is that last point there. Uh, and you can see that every year there's, there's lots of ups and downs, right? That's, that's an important part of what's going on. There's a lot of noise in that temperature. Um, uh, but then there's a very clear trend. If you, if you average over a, a few years, you can see that you know, back in the 19th century, uh, it was kind of cool. There was a bit of a dip there. It warmed up to the 1940s. It was flat for a while. And then since around 1975, um, things have been moving upwards. But there's a lot of noise, right? There's a lot of ups and downs. And, and you, shouldn't, you shouldn't think that that's, that's not important. That is important. Um, and it's certainly important for how people perceive the changes that we've seen. It's also important to note what the scale is here. Right? You know, on the picture that we had before, the maximum numbers were two, four, six degrees. Right? Um, but when you average everything over the globe, uh, the numbers, and this is to, with respect to the same baseline, uh, the numbers are quite small. So they go from like you know, minus 0.4 to 0.6. That's a degree Celsius, roughly two degrees Fahrenheit in, uh, in magnitude. Now, whether that's a big number or a small number, really depends on the planet, right? It, it might be a very significant thing that's happened, but it might not have any practical consequences. Well, the fact is that, that it does have practical consequences. The parts of the planet that integrate over all the noise, the ice fields, the glaciers, uh, the plants, the ecosystems, all of these things have reacted to these temperatures by the ice sheets, they're melting, the glaciers, they're melting, the plants, they're moving poleward and upward, uh, trying to search for their kind of uh, uh, climatic niche. Uh, if you were. So this is uh, a small number, but it's actually uh, quite significant.
And so here we are at the end, right? And you can see 2012, that wasn't a record-breaking year. You can see that this year was warmer, that was 2010. This year was warmer, 2005. And then there was this really kind of outlier year uh, back in 1998. Uh, and we'll get to the reasons for, for why those were warmer than the others in a second. Um, that was in the globe, right? So that's the whole globe average. Uh, but we can also look at, at different parts of the globe, right? So this is the northern latitude. So this is everything uh, north of the, uh, of the of the tropics, and you can see that's a very similar pattern. You know, cool, warming to the 1940s, flattening, and then and then coming back up. And again, you can see that the noise is is there. It's very clear, um, and you can see, but basically the same the same pattern. Uh, in the tropics themselves, you can see things have warmed in a more kind of uh, linear fashion, if you like, but there's still a lot of noise. And if you actually look at the size of these anomalies, they're actually quite large. And, and I'll try and, and I'll explain what these uh, what these are about uh, before as well uh, in a minute as well. And in the southern latitude, so this is everywhere south of the tropics, uh, going down to the South Pole. Um, the error bars here, that these green lines, they're larger because we have less data from, from those kind of places. There's less land, there's less people. Um, but you can see that that's been warming steadily as well. In fact, that's been warming, I think, more steadily the, than anywhere else. But the numbers are actually smaller. So the south has warmed less than the north, um, but there's a lot of noise in the tropics. And so all, that, all of these things need to be explained if you're going to try and understand how temperatures are changing year by year. If you look at the, the U.S. temperature, which is about 4% of the northern hemisphere as a whole, right, the, then you know, the change is about the same, but the noise is much larger. If you look at the, the envelope of the noise, that's like 2 degrees. So the envelope of the noise in one particular location is much larger than the noise over the whole globe. Right? And, that, and that's, uh, that's an important thing to, uh, to bear in mind. Now. Um, we said that last year the U.S. had a particularly warm year, and you can see now this is the 1930s. This is uh, the time of the Dust Bowl. This is 1934, which was a particularly warm year, uh, kind of right in the middle of, of, of that period. Uh, huge droughts in that time period as well. Uh, and you can see it kind of the temperatures fell, and then you know since again around 1970 they started to rise up again. And so this is 2011. Here this is 2012. Right, so 2012, we had to extend the graph, right, because you know we had to change the axes because it was so far uh, off the uh, off the scale. Now, does it mean that we're going to be up there forever? You know, no. I mean, next year it's very likely. If you look at all the ups and downs, it's very likely that it's going to be colder than that, right? Does that mean that that global warming has stopped? No, it doesn't. It just means that there's a lot of noise that adds to the long-term trends, uh, and that you know, that that's what makes the records. So. Okay, so um, how does the media report these things? So this is in the Daily Mail. Uh, the media reports these things by taking a tiny little fraction of that record. So they picked a period here from August 1997 to August 2012 and, uh, and made it seem like there's nothing happening at all. Ah, there's nothing happening at all. See, and the Met Office, this is Met Office data from the UK, and the Met Office saying that global warming has stopped. Um, uh, Canada is not immune from, from silliness, um, and they, they, they use graphs like this. So, you know, by, by putting the, the zero point, you know, look, nothing has happened. Nothing has happened at all. It, it, so, interestingly enough, this, uh, this kind of scaling is equivalent to trying to hide a, uh, like a 60-foot sea level rise by using the total depth of the ocean. Right, because like 60 foot in sea level rise, well, that's not going to bother anybody, is it? No, look how small it is in the percentage terms. Of course, in temperature, this is completely arbitrary. Um, you know, and if they'd done it in Fahrenheit, it would have been completely different. So uh, they can make up their own thing. So, so this is um, this is people who are trying to hide something from you, uh, and and uh, and judging by their comment sections, uh, they are actually managing to hide it from quite a lot of people. But the uh, the fact of the matter is that this is. These are not fair depictions of what's going on. Right? Um, if, we, if we can examine that a little bit further, um, this, is, uh, this is a graph I made based on, on what they did there. There's a, there's a lot here. I'm going to walk you through it. So uh, um, this is uh, that same data. right? And this is the data that they plotted, you know, just from this line here to there. Right? 
So, you know, the fact that, you know, they're ignoring all of this stuff. This goes back to, like, 1975, and the rest of it, you know, you know what it looks like. Right? Um, uh, this, is the, this is the bit that they plotted, right? This blue line. So that's the blue line that's the trend from this particular period to that particular period. Now, the reason why they picked that particular period is because that was the flattest they could make it. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's not... It's not like, oh, well, this is a particularly important thing that the trend from August 1997 should be important. They just picked August 1997 because that gave us the flattest line. Right? If, they'd, if they'd picked a time uh, a little later, then it would have been nicely positive. If they'd picked a time a little earlier, it would have been nicely positive. But that's not the message they wanted to show. And so, uh, you know, you, you're, you're, you're people are, it's, what call, it's what's called cherry picking. You're picking different pieces of the fruit. Yes, you can, you, can, you can say that, indeed. My, my point is going to be a slightly different one. Um, so you can, you, can, you can pick this, and you can put these lines. These, calculating these straight lines through a set of points is a standard mathematical thing, and you can calculate what the number is. There's no, uh, there's no, uh, uh, there's no mystery here. But what you're doing is you're basically looking at noise. Right? So you're looking at the day-to-day -day fluctuations on, the, on Wall Street instead of the long-term uh, growth records of, of any particular stock or something like that. Um, now, it, the, the, it was quite interesting that they picked that period uh, because if you, take the, uh, if you take the trend, say, from 1975, which is the beginning of that warming period, to July 1997, right, which is just before they started this thing, then you would have ended up with this green line. And then if you said, okay, well, if that was the trend that we thought was happening up until then, and we just extended it forward to, uh, to August 2012, it got August 2012 right to three decimal places, which is pretty, pretty amazing, actually. <laughs> 0.524 degrees Celsius was the estimate, and 0 0.523 degrees was the actual number, which obviously is just coincidence, but it does tell you that you know, this is a, if you'd done that, if you'd extended that line out, you'd have actually had a pretty good estimate of what was going on. Curiously enough, if you take the trend over that whole period, right, the trend has actually increased because you've had, you know, basically periods that are um, permanently warm, right? We've moved into a new permanently warm plateau, if you like. Uh, so the longer this goes on, the longer the, the, the higher these trends are going to get. Um, and so that's actually greater. So, so it's, it's odd that, you're, that they claim that there's been no warming since then, but actually this has actually increased the warming since before then. It's kind of contradictory. It just means that it's, there's, not, there's not any magic in the mathematics. It's just that this kind of mathematics is not very good at making predictions, right? Putting straight lines through things, you know, uh, put a straight line through, I, I don't know, think of something, and then extrapolate it forever, it's not generally a good idea. Um, more, uh, more kind of robustly, um, you can look at things like decadal means, right? So I said earlier on that the, the, the longer the period that you average over and the bigger the area that you average over, the stronger the signal becomes, right? And so if you look at the decadal means, which are these purple lines here, right? That was, that was the 1980s, that's the 1990s, the 2000s, the last 10 years. Uh, and you can see that every, every 10 years, like, we're kind of moving up. Um, and that's a very strong signal. And that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about global warming. We're not talking about, you know, whether it's cooled or warm since last Tuesday. We're talking about what the long-term trend is in the temperature. Now, we talk about that because we think we understand why that is. Now, we understand some of these ups and downs, too, and I'll go, I'll go into that. But basically, the reason why we're warming at a steady pace in the decadal means is because we're adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere and prominent among those is carbon dioxide. Um, the key thing here is that you, know, you, can, you can find trends. In fact, in fact you, can, you can find negative trends in the whole time series and you just join them up one after the other and every trend is negative, but of course the whole, the whole trend is positive. Uh, and there's, there's a great, uh, I should have brought that, there's a great, uh, a GIF uh, animation on skeptical science called the uh, the skeptic elevator, where you know you just go uh, through the time series and they show oh negative trend, negative trend, negative trend, but all the time at a higher and higher level, and uh, and, uh, 
that's how you know, some people in the media see the temperature change. So, so what is actually going on in these short-term uh, cases? And, and there's some very interesting physics there, and, and I, I recommend that you, you kind of look into it. And, and the biggest impact on this is what's called uh, the El Nino-La Nina uh, oscillation or, or phenomena. And, and I'm sure Richard will mention this a little bit later on as well. Um, this is a, a phenomena that's, uh, that's mostly kind of character, that's uh, kind of a big deal in the, in the Pacific. Um, and so wh what, I, what I picked here is, this is the difference between 2011, which was a La Nina year, and 1998, which was a big El Nino year. Right? And you can see the difference. So 2011 was a little bit colder than 1998. Uh, but you can see where that temperature change is coming from. It's coming from this big patch of cooling uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the tropical Pacific. And, and this, is very, uh, this is a very familiar pattern to people who look at these things. So you've got this big cooling right on the equator, and you've got this kind of horseshoe of warm temperatures around it. And, and this is very... Um, uh, 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 reminiscent of, of this La Nina pattern. And an El Nino pattern, you can think of it as just the flip of that. So in an El Nino, this area would be warm and this area would be cool. And this is such a large and important part of the, of the planet's climate that it actually has an impact on the global temperature. Right? You can see every year when there's a, an El Nino, you're a little bit warmer. Every year when there's a La Nina, you're a little bit cooler. There's a little bit of a lag um, as, uh, as all the bits kind of come into place. But you can, a lot of that ups and downs, a lot of those ups and downs that you see, uh, they're associated with the El Nino La Nina phenomena. And so 2011 was a La Nina, relatively cold. 1998 was an El Nino, relatively hot. Right? So, um, yeah. uh, so we can quantify that. There's, uh, there's what's called an ENSO index, which is the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Uh, and that basically takes a, 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 a sea surface temperature average in this region here. And when that's negative, then you've got a La Nina, and when it's positive, you have an El Nino, right? And that gives us a kind of independent uh, uh, estimate of when these uh, particular phenomena are, are going on. What happens, the dynamics of this is fascinating. So what happens is you have kind of waves that go across the, uh, the Pacific that kind of push the, the clouds and the convection from one end to the other. This is normally where everything is going on. It kind of, in an El Nino, it kind of moves further towards South America. In a La Nina, it moves further towards uh, Australia and, uh, and Indonesia. And, it, and everything changes. Rainfall patterns change, waves change, temperatures change. Uh, it's, it's a really big deal. So um, what you can do is you can say, OK, well, I understand a little bit about how the temperatures change uh, as a function of El Nino or La Nina, and I can take that away. Right? I'm going to just adjust the temperatures so that I'm going to try and take away the influence of that. And then you end up with a picture like this. Right? So if you, re if you remember the global mean temperature, there was a lot more ups and downs, but like, when you take away the, uh, the El Nino effect, what you end up with, and this is, four, uh, this is five different estimates of the global surface mean temperature, uh, you can see that the, that the amount of ups and downs is much less. And then you end up with... Uh, with a trend that you know continues all the way up to 2012, so there's no there's no you know if you go to like 1997, which is when that graphic was uh, was was uh, talking about. So this is 95, 96, so 97. So there's a very clear long-term trend that is subsequent to 1997, um, and that's because what's happened is the last few years we've had a couple of really big La Ninas, uh, which in 2010 was a big La Nina, uh, the end of 2010. And then in 2012, uh, there was a kind of semi-La Nina. And then uh, this year, we're going into ENSO neutral conditions. So uh, it's kind of neither, neither one thing nor the other. And I'll tell you, I'll show you what that implication that has in a second. Um, and so when you look at that data, again, I apologize, there's a lot of information here. So again, this is the temperature, right? So, but, it, but the temperatures aren't all joined up like they were before. Right, so here, this would be the temperature that you actually saw if you joined up all the lines. Right, this is the, there's that 1998 point again. Right, there's that 2011 point. It's the same data, but what they've done here is they've stratified it by whether there was an El Nino condition or a La Nina condition or something in the middle. So if you draw a line through all the El Ninos, right, which are all warmer than average, you get this warm trend that's going up. 
If you put a line through all the La Ninas, you also get a trend that's going up, and you'll notice that the trends are the same, right? So what's happening is that you've got noise, El Nino, La Nina, El Nino, La Nina, but then you've got a baseline that's moving, right? And that baseline is moving up, and that's, that's that forced signal. That's the signal that's being driven by uh, human activities for the most part. And so you can actually, based on that, you can make a prediction for where 2013 is going to end up. Uh, we haven't really started 2013 yet in, in this kind of thing, so this is a real prediction. Um, and since we're in an ENSO neutral state, that's this, that's this yellow line, uh, what we're estimating, well, this is an estimate from uh, the state climatologist of Texas. Uh, so that's important. Um, and, uh, and he's estimating that this is where you would end up with 2013. And actually, it's very interesting if you look at it, he's actually predicting that this is going to be the warmest year on record, right? Just based on what the phase of ENSO is in the last few months. So if that comes out, obviously there's some, you know, if it's here, then it won't be, but if it's here, it'll be a really big deal. Uh, it seems likely then that we will see a new record this year. It won't stop people pretending that global warming stopped 16 years ago, um, but it's a little bit odd that global warming stops and yet there's still so many records being broken. You know, I wonder, 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 wonder why that is, you know. It's, um, when we go forward for further times, uh, what we need are models. Uh, and the models that we use are what are called general circulation models. Uh, they're big, they're complicated, lots of lines of Fortran code. Some of you old timers might know what that is. Um, and uh, every so often we get together, all the modeling groups, and we make predictions for, for what's going to happen if carbon dioxide continues to increase or something else is going to change. Um, we did that uh, a while ago uh, in what was called CMIP3, uh, and that was done in the early 2000s. And so what people did was they, they used observational data for the, the sun and volcanoes and greenhouse gases up to the year 2000, and they ran their models. And then after the year 2000, they said, okay, well, where's carbon dioxide? Where do we really think that's going to go? We made some, some prediction about that. Um, and, and so all of these, uh, everything that's in these gray bars are all these different model runs. There's about 57 different model runs that went into making this particular plot. And this gray bar is a measure of, of, of the weather, essentially. It's, like, it's saying that, well, you know, some models, when they got to here, they had an El Nino, and they'd be up there. And some models, when they got there, they'd have a La Nino, because that's part of the noise. It's part of the, the internal variability. And uh, so this spread is pretty much what you expect, uh, just based on, you know, the uncertainty in the weather, and the fact that we don't know where we are in, in, in so space, if you like. Uh, there's a couple of big dips. There's a dip here in the 1990s, 91, 1991, in fact, uh, and that was because there was a big volcano. And when there's a big volcano that throws up a lot of stuff into the atmosphere, uh, that cools the planet because that provides a shielding to solar radiation. There was another volcano here in the 1980s, El Chichong. Uh, but apart from that, what you're looking at here is a slow trend because of the increase in greenhouse gases combined with noise associated with Enso and La Nina and the like. So this, this was 1998, that was a warm year in the real world, uh, but the models don't know anything about that, so they don't always have a big point here, but, but you know, but they have a spread. And then from here on in, from 2000 onwards, what you have is the predictions, essentially. Um, now, the carbon dioxide changes have been pretty much what we expected. Uh, there have been a couple of small volcanoes, there's been some change in the sun that wasn't properly taken into account. Uh, but basically, this is what we expect the real world to be doing. And this is the average of all those models. So that has, that's averaging over a lot of that weather. So uh, that's not a really fair comparison to just make with one uh, particular realization of the real world. Uh, but here we are, there's 2012. And so what you can see is that the real world is pretty much well within the band of what we predicted. And uh, this goes on, this goes on, and you can see, can you see the dot? It goes on, <laughs> ends up over there somewhere. <laughs> um, if you know, we continue on a business as usual uh, trajectory, which we don't see any uh, sign that we're not going to do uh, right yet. Um, and, uh, and what we anticipate is that the real world will you know, basically follow that. Um, if uh, Nielsen Gammon's uh, prediction is correct, 2013 will be up here. And then you'll, and it'll just be kind of obvious that the real world is actually following 
uh, what the model was predicted they would actually do. And this is important because this, was, this is an out-of-sample test, right? You know, we didn't know what this data was going to be before we did the models, right? So, so they're real predictions that can, be, that can be tested in time. So um, let me conclude, and then I'm going to turn it over to, the, uh, to our other guys. Um, global warming, the long-term trend in temperatures since the 19th century and most, uh, most recently since the 19, uh, 1970s, um, has been remarkably steady. Once you take a, a account of all the ups and downs and the noise in the system and the things that have nothing to do with us, uh, it's, it's been continuing for a, for a long while. Um, there's no indication that we can tell that global warming has stopped uh, or slowed. Uh, if you look at other metrics, like the amount of heat going into the ocean, that's increasing uh, continuously. If you look at other metrics, like the Arctic sea ice, that is decreasing pretty much continuously. Um, you know, this, these, there's noise, uh, but, but the, our ongoing experiment, uh, our ongoing geophysical experiment is, is continuing. Um, the short-term variability is really strongly affected by, and so by El Nino, by internal variability, by where the jet stream is this particular uh, winter time. And you have to take that into account. You have to uh, look through that to see what the long-term trends is. If, uh, if people spend a lot of time just looking at the weather, then it's kind of like you're, you're not seeing the forest for the trees. Um, one of the ways to get around that is to look at these like kind of long-term means, you know, like every 10 years, how are things changing? And, and every 10 years, we're in a warmer place. And in the next 10 years, we'll be in a warmer place still. Um, because we're in an ENSO neutral phase, so neither La Nina or El Nino, uh, 2013 um, looks like it's, it's gonna be a, a new record. Now, this is being recorded. Right, so um, I'm going to say very clearly, it's not my, it's not my prediction. It was the other guy, <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, it, it, it is, uh, it is a reasonable uh, and uh, uh, it's a reasonable way of predicting things. And then, of course, the biggest, uh, the, the biggest thing you should always bear in mind is, is don't believe anything you read in the newspapers, uh, particularly not the Daily Mail or the National Post. <laughs> okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Richard. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Why is that uh, El Nino and Nino phenomenon so important? Why is that area of the world so critical for the global impact? So that's, that's, a, that's a great question. So um, the, the topics are the most important. The tropics are the warmest part of the planet, and that's where most of the, the deep convection happens. You know, these, these big towering cumulus clouds that you see, uh, you know, tropical downpours. Uh, and most of that is centered in the Western Pacific, right? So around Indonesia, uh, Borneo, north of uh, the northern part of Australia. That's the Western Pacific warm pool. That is probably the key player in global climate. It sets up the, 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 it sets up the, how much water vapor is in the air, it sets up where the Hadley cell is, it sets up uh, the circulation that determines where you're going to have a wet area and where you're going to have a dry area. It, it's a really key part of, uh, of the planet. And uh, an El Nino is a perturbation to that really key thing. Right? So uh, that, that area of convection, which is normally over the Western Pacific, it can move. Right? And, and there's a couple of very interesting uh, kinds of dynamics that are happening in the atmosphere and in the ocean that cause that to move. Uh, so it's a coupled thing. It doesn't happen when you just have an ocean. It doesn't happen when you just look at the atmosphere. But it's, it's, a, coupled, uh, uh, it's, it's a coupled phenomena. Um, and, that, uh, and that can move. And it has this kind of like three to five year periodicity. Uh, and it can move a little bit further towards... Uh, South America, and it can move a little bit further away from South America. And that is, uh, it makes a huge impact on rainfall patterns uh, in Indonesia. Uh, in an El Nino, uh, Indonesia is in drought, Australia is in drought, but the rain in Peru is huge, right? So El Nino comes from uh, the Spanish fishermen uh, in, uh, in Peru who first noticed this phenomena, and they would say, okay, well, there's, there's years when you know, uh, we're not catching any fish, and then there's years when we're catching lots of fish, and it would come in at Christmas time, and so it kind of came with the Christ child, so El Nino. Um, when, when scientists started looking at this, 
Uh, and they said, okay, well, look, there's a positive thing, which is this El Nino, and then there's this negative thing. What should we call it? And for a while there, somebody, uh, a few people tried to call it the anti-El Nino, but then like the Antichrist really didn't translate very well, so, so that got tossed, and so now we call it La Nina, the, the, the girl child, right? So, uh, but it, it's a really crucial part of the system. Okay, just a quick uh, introduction of the two panelists. Both of them are climate scientists at the La Mondauti uh, Earth Observatory. Jason Smearden, who will talk first, <coughs> is a, a Lamont Associate Research Professor. He's also an adjunct professor at the um, School of International and Public Affairs, and he's a member of the Earth Institute uh, faculty. Richard is a Lamont Research Professor. He's also the Palisades Geophysical Institute Chair, and he's a member of the Earth Institute faculty. So, Jason. Thanks, Peter. Um, I'm going to use this mic because I tend to dance around and it's going to be more comfortable for me. Uh, I jumped in front of Richard because I wanted to save the best for last, of course, but I also think that there's a bit of an arc to what we're trying to accomplish today. Uh, what Gavin has presented is essentially a change, of course this was called ch -ch changes. Uh, he reported on the changes that we understand in the global mean over time, so looked at these secular changes in the climate system and what Richard and I would like to do in these latter two talks is talk about extremes and, and changes in extremes. I'm going to take the temperature component, so I'll talk about changes in temperature extremes uh, that have both been observed and what we expect in the future. And then Richard will finish up uh, with hydrological extremes, and so talk about the kinds of changes that we expect with regard to uh, moisture in the climate system. So that's the roadmap and uh, the, the idea behind the arc, and so as I said, I'm going to take temperature extremes, and of course, what Gavin has already presented sets me up very well to do this. And so I'm going to start where everybody starts when they talk about temperature extremes in the climate system, which is steroids and baseball. So the reason why I want to talk about this, and the reason why people often talk about steroids and baseball when they discuss extremes in temperature or extremes in the climate system over time, is because it's an apt example, and it's a useful way of, of discussing these. I'm going to torture it even more than normal today uh, and just set you up for thinking about how to conceptualize changes in temperature extremes within the climate system, both in terms of what, we observed, what we've observed and how they're moving forward. Uh, so if you're a commissioner who cares about steroids and baseball, you can imagine doing a few different things to try to decide whether or not it's a problem and, it's, and it exists within, the within, the, uh, within your players. What would you imagine doing? All right. How would you imagine testing whether or not this is something that's occurring? And the first thing I would say is that you could drug test your players. All right. And we haven't talked about causes behind some of these changes, but of course lying behind a lot of the discussion we're having today is the cause in the changes that we're observing in the climate system, which I'm not going to spoil the ending here. For many of us, or, or what's been determined uh, time and time again, is the increases in greenhouse gases that have uh, accumulated in the atmosphere over the last century and are expected to continue uh, through the 21st. And so one of the ways that you can think about this example is you could go and test your players for steroids. And similarly, in the climate system, we could go out and look for the causes that we would expect to be causing these changes. And we've done that in broad scale. So one of the ways of thinking about this analogy is going out, measuring the things that we recognize are changing, that we recognize would cause the kinds of temperature changes, changes in temperature extremes to be occurring in the climate system. And if we found steroids in our players or increases in CO2 in the atmosphere, we can associate those changes with the, um, or those changes in atmospheric constituents, the cause, with what we're observing as well in the climate system. The other way, of course, of doing this is to look at statistics. And one of the great things about baseball is that they've been keeping statistics for over a century now, uh, and there's a lot to look at. And so when you think about extremes, one of the useful ways of thinking about this is with regard to home run statistics in baseball. All right, and so the way to imagine this is imagine some of your players start using steroids, getting stronger, hitting the ball harder. What kinds of statistics could you look at to determine whether or not this is a widespread problem within, uh, within the league. And so this is just an example of where someone has done that. And there's a couple ways to think about this. One is to just look at home run statistics over time. So this is home runs uh, since 1960, moving forward through to 2006. These are the number of players with home runs over 45. Okay. So you can see these bar graphs here 
you know, going back into 1960, uh, mid-20s. And you can look at the numbers increase as you move into what this particular author calls the steroid era. But you can see this significant increase in the number of home runs that occurred uh, during this period of time. And you can imagine that as being a measure of this influence of steroids on the, on, on the league and how players are hitting. Now, there might be other things like rule changes and so on. But you can make a strong argument that something happened here in the way that in the number of balls that were being hit out of the park and as an indication of the use of, of steroids within the game. I should say that the reason why this is important is because you're looking, similar to what uh, Gavin talked about in terms of spatial variability and noise, is at any given time if a player like Barry Bonds hits a ball out of the park, it doesn't mean that's because he's taking steroids. It of course is something that was possible without them, but if you look at the statistics in aggregate, if you look at the individual players or the, the, the numbers for the entire league, this kind of a signal begins to jump out and you can see it. Now another way of thinking about this is through probability distribution. So the other thing that this particular author has done is looked at the expected number of balls hit a certain distance. So this axis here is range in meters, zero meters up through, this is the threshold for home runs. And there's two different distributions on here. There's a red distribution and a blue distribution. And the red distribution is this author's estimate of the distances of the balls that are hit. Of course there are many balls, some go out of the park, some don't. Uh, but the distance of the balls hit if you increase the velocities by 4% in all cases. And what you can see is the number of balls that were hit out of the park for this case where the balls were being hit slower is around 10% of this particular distribution. And for the number that was hit with the increase in velocities, it increases to 16.6%. Uh, so roughly a 66% increase in the number of home runs that were hit. All right? And I want you to think about this distribution because it's very useful for thinking about how we consider extremes within the climate system and how we approach uh, many extreme events. In this case, we're going to be thinking about temperature and temperature extremes. All right? So that's the analogy I want you to keep in mind, and now I want to talk more specifically about extremes within the climate system. So there's different ways that you can get more extremes. All right? And again, we're talking specifically about temperature in this case. But the way I want you to think about this is this is just a typical bell curve. All right? with a mean at the peak, and then what we would call, if this is temperature along this axis, what we would call warm extremes might occur up here in the tail of the distribution, and the cold extremes would occur down here in the lower part of the distribution. Now when we talk about standard deviations, all right, usually as we march up this tail, it represents uh, fewer and fewer possibilities of getting those extremes on each side of the distribution. So we usually talk about uh, one standard deviation about the mean as including roughly 66% of the variance. As we go up to two, roughly 95. So these extremes exist on the tails as only 5% of the, of the occurrences that you would expect, okay? So if this is your original distribution, like temperature, all right, say globally at a given location, you can imagine increasing the number of extremes that you get on the warm end. So this tail in the original distribution is just this part of the pie or this slice. But as you increase the mean, if you take this distribution and you increase the mean, all of a sudden what you call the threshold for your extreme and the number of events it contained in the small part of the distribution now includes this much larger part. So one way of getting more warm extremes in the climate system is simply by increasing the mean. And Gavin very convincingly showed how we are increasing the mean both globally and in specific locations. And that, for temperature, is a very useful way of thinking about how we increase extremes. You'll also notice that we've reduced the cold extremes. So in the increase of this distribution, we've moved this tail out of the area that we would have considered very cold extremes. All right? So in that case, we've increased the number of warm extremes, reduced the number of uh, cold extremes. Well, we can do other things with this distribution, too. We can squash it down. So again, this is our original distribution. We can squash it down and increase the length of the tails on either side. In this case, what we've done, again, here is the original number of, say, hot days or hot weather and the number of cold weather. And as we've increased the distribution and made the tails to lay farther out, we've increased now, if you look at the area under the curve, we've increased the number of events occurring within those extremes as well. And we've done it symmetrically. So we've now, in this case, increased the number of cold events, reduced the number of uh, and increase the number of warm events. And I should say the other important thing here is that within these distributions, look at the dark reds and dark blues here. These are extremes that would have never been possible in the previous climate. So see how the, the distribution only goes up to here roughly. 
this part of the distribution that we now include in the shifted distribution, whether we've changed the mean or increased the variance, now exists in a case where those are extreme or, or, or temperatures that are warm or cold in a scenario that we would have never expected to have given that previous distribution. All right? And then, of course, what we can do uh, with these two different cases is put them together where we have both a mean shift and a variance shift, which in the case of, say, a warmer climate, includes now even more extreme events lying above that part in the distribution that we previously thought of as the cutoff for our extremes. All right? And in many cases, depending on the extremes you're talking about, you're doing one or both of these things. All right? and so, in terms of temperature, one of the easiest things to think about is, again, this changing mean. It's something that Gavin went through and talked about. And it's a very straightforward response to what you would expect in a changing climate if you did nothing else from the distribution. So one of the nice things about temperature extremes, it's very easy to conceptualize just through a changing mean in the climate, just through a forcing that would cause the climate to gradually warm over time. Even if you keep the same distribution, you would expect to see an increase in temperature extremes because you've shifted the mean of the distribution. All right, and so this is very consistent with the idea of global warming, with what we'd expect in a warming climate. And one of the things that we can do now, just like steroids in baseball and looking at uh, home run statistics, we can go into the climate system, look at observations, and see if there's evidence for changes in these extreme events uh, in various locations about the world. So a canonical example of this, of course, is the European heat wave in 2003. Uh, some of you may remember this event. Was anyone in Europe at the time? Anyone? So a few of you. Was it hot? <laughs> All right, it was a warm summer, a very warm summer, several standard deviations above the long-term mean. So this is the Central Europe uh, June, July, August temperature, so we're looking at summer temperatures now. This is going back to about the mid-1700s, and you can see how those summer temperatures vary over time, and this is the 2003 event. All right, so it was a very warm event. This is, of course, just in, uh, as a measure in Central Europe, but all over Europe at the time, uh, when it was a very uh, warm summer, and in this particular uh, summary, the, the IPCC, I, I hope many of you probably are aware of the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, but of course it represents this consortium of scientists who look at the field of climate science every five to seven years, make an assessment about the state of the science, and these were the statements they made about that particular heat wave in 2003 in Europe, uh, calling it both the hottest summer since 1780, where they were using these actual observational records, but then they also said it was the hottest since at least 1500 based on natural archives, that, what we call paleoclimate archives that preserve uh, records of past change. I can update that today with uh, a paper that's actually in preparation that I'm working on with my European colleagues where we've done reconstructions now back over 2,000 years. So this is going back to prior to uh, the turn of the first, well, <laughs> back to 1 AD and a little bit beforehand. Uh, up through 2000. Here is that European summer temperature, and it still remains the warmest temperature in this estimate back over 2,000 years, so back to Roman times. You can also, there's some interesting things in this curve showing that the Roman times were actually quite warm. Uh, the period we know as the medieval climate anomaly was also quite warm, but even against those background periods, 2003 stands out as the warmest summer temperature uh, recorded in these proxies over that time interval. The other thing that you should note is this is very consistent with the way that we talked about these distributions generally. So what this is showing is the distribution of summer temperatures between 1961 and 1990 in blue, all right, the frequency of temperatures. This is summer, June, July, August temperature uh, distribution. And this is the distribution for that summer temperature, uh, for those summer temperatures in 2003 in Europe. And you can very much see that distributional shift in the mean in particular in Europe during that summer, and it's very consistent with the way that we would think about these extremes. So most of the summer, the average of the summer, was well, was very close to uh, one or two standard deviations already above the long-term mean distribution. So a significant part of the entire summer was uh, well above the mean, and in many cases above the warmest temperatures that had been recorded in Europe at the time. Uh, so it was a big event. I like to appeal to the IPCC in terms of summarizing some of these observations and extreme events because at the end of the day, I'm just one schmuck who's standing up here and talking to you about uh, things from my perspective. But what this really represents is a collective uh, synthesis of the science as it stands every, every five to seven years. And I think it's worth reading these statements because it really does represent a wide consensus on what we know about extremes and, and what we understand about them. <clears throat> 
So this is their statement in 2007. There'll be a new report coming out next year, but this is the synthesis as it stood uh, in 2007. Changes in extremes of temperatures are also consistent with warming of the climate. Again, this idea that I've already presented. A widespread reduction in the number of frost days in mid-latitude regions, an increase in the number of warm extremes, and a reduction in the number of daily cold extremes are observed in 70 to 75 percent of the land regions where data are available. The most marked changes are for cold, so that low end of the distribution, uh, the lowest 10 percent based on the 6190 mean night, which have become rarer over the 51 to 2003 period. So cold nights have become much rarer, and warm nights have become much more frequent. All right? the highest 10% of those distributions. So again, very consistent with this idea and the shift of the distribution, what we would expect under these warming scenarios. So if we take a, a, a global view of this, there's, there's different ways that this can be mapped. Now, Gavin has already shown you anomalies. So this is, again, are those spatial maps of anomalies, but in this case, it's just June, July, August temperatures, all right, with a base period of 1951 to 1980. And what this these maps are doing is stepping through the years. This is 1955, 65, 75, and then these are the last several uh, years. So it's 06, 07, 08, 09, 2010, and 2011. And what is being plotted is the temperature anomalies relative to that base period. And if you just look at the way this is going, you're of course seeing many more red periods representing the warmer periods on these scales. And note these are actually different scalings uh, here, but the point is, is that the regions are getting warmer relative to that historical mean. All right, so that's something that Gavin already showed you. But now if you think about these distributions, you think in terms of standard deviations, I think it's a very interesting plot to look at when you look at the same maps, all right, but what these colors now represent is the numbers of standard deviations above the long-term mean that exist. All right? So what these represent is, as you go up in numbers here from two to three and so on, the number of standard deviations that you're stepping out on that distribution, that probability distribution. And what this is showing is that in most cases, the warm temperatures that are being seen are statistically what you would, would be very rare statistically what you would expect from this earlier distribution. So that these are things that you would not expect to see without a shift in the distribution. If we just assume that historical distribution, these are events, warming events at all these locations that you would not expect to be seeing otherwise. All right? And you can see, I mean, this is a scary progression in terms of the, the standard deviations away from that long-term mean that we would expect. So I want to finally say something about the future. So Gavin talked about what the observations are. Of course, that's what I've been doing. I want to just show you a couple uh, estimates of how we expect things to change into the future. So these are the distributions for the first, uh, well, from 2020 to 2029, and then the distribution at the end of the 21st century in the global mean for different scenarios, all right? So these scenarios represent different assumptions about the choices we're going to make uh, as societies, how much greenhouse, how we're going to change our mix of, of energy and so on. But what they all show is if you accept this as an initial distribution within the century, this increase in the mean, and also a tendency towards warmer events later, uh, higher up on the distribution. All right? So that's again consistent with what uh, we've already talked about. But now this is an interesting map showing how the summers are expected to change by looking at the number of events that are above any previous warm temperatures uh, relative to the baseline. All right, so what 100% represents here is the number of days that are warmer than any other temperature that had been seen that summer uh, in the distribution. So what it's saying is that large parts of the land masses, 100% of the summer events are warmer than what we would have called the most extreme events previously. All right, so this again is a measure of what we expect to see in the changes and how we're expecting to move into a regime that in many cases, in terms of extreme events, are things that we haven't even seen yet. So this is the tail end of the distribution that's getting above all of those extreme events that we previously uh, had experience for, which were already way out on the distribution. These are things that don't even exist at this point uh, on the distributions. All right? So it's a sobering idea in terms of what our adaption is going to need to look like, what we're used to presently, and what these extremes will look like uh, moving into the end of the century. And finally, I just want to leave with a couple thoughts of why we care. All right? So we've looked very specifically at temperature extremes, and in some cases, they get short shrift uh, to things like cyclones and other maybe more uh, immediately catastrophic events. But if you actually look at the impacts that temperature extremes have on societies, they are numerous, and in some cases, um, more 
destructive when you add them all up. So of course there are health impacts. Uh, warm summers, of course, impact disproportionately uh, the, the elderly and people without access to summer shelters, et cetera. So these have, uh, as I mentioned with the um, European heat wave, the reported deaths associated with that 2003 uh, heat wave were around 70,000. So a lot of people die during these very extreme events. Of course, infrastructure damages, when we think about sustainability and moving forward, uh, making ourselves more resilient to the changes that we expect to happen. Uh, transportation can be affected, roads buckle, train lines kink, uh, airports close because air airplanes can't get as much lift in warm weather. If you don't believe me, try flying out of Phoenix uh, in late summer where they do have fairly consistent uh, airplane uh, airport closures. Higher demand for energy, power lines sag and cause power outages, etc. Water resources are stressed um, as for instance, infrastructure that's susceptible to heat has to be watered down to maintain, its, uh, to maintain colder temperatures, like bridges that are susceptible to these things. Forest fires, of course, are uh, susceptible to both hydrological change as well as temperature change, but we certainly uh, will expect more of these moving forward. It's something that we've already seen. And then agriculture uh, is, of course, also affected. Livestock mortality. Uh, animals are people too, of course, and they're affected in the same way that many humans are uh, to these extreme temperatures. And one of the most disconcerting things uh, is crop yields. It's been, uh, I think, worked out over the last several uh, years that many crops can be fairly drought resistant. Of course, droughts uh, include both te precip and temperature effects. But there's certain things that are grown, for instance, in the tropics that just don't have much room to go in terms of how they will respond to very warm temperatures. And it's expected that crop yields will certainly fall and mortality uh, will be the consequence of some of these more extreme temperatures, particularly in the tropics moving into the 21st century. So those are things to think about. Oh, and I should just say it's going to cost us a lot, too. Of course, this uh, includes many things uh, as far as weather disasters are concerned, but these are the number of events over time back to 1980 up through uh, present day. Of the number of events over costing the U.S. over a billion dollars, you can see this uh, trend just like the temperature uh, data. This is infl inflation adjusted, uh, and it is something that's going to cost us more as we move into these more extreme environments. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to Richard. The links between climate and um, hydrological extremes, in particular drought, and um, mostly about North America, but not entirely about North America. Um, so as you all know, we are now in year three of a pretty serious drought um, within North America, within the United States, but also in Mexico. Um, the map on the, the upper right is the U.S. drought monitor for last week. Those maps come out every Thursday, so the next one comes out at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning um, from the Department of Agriculture, NOAA, and various other federal um, agencies. And, um, and then the North American drought monitor, which includes information from Canada and Mexico, um, only comes out once a month, and the February map is the one there on the, um, on the top left. Um, so um, what you can see is that although we've come through um, a winter and we're heading off into spring and summer, um, the United States, and to a lesser extent Mexico, is already in an extraordinarily severe drought um, situation. Um, I don't know how many of you have actually been out west um, recently. I was out there in February in Colorado, and um, I'd never seen this in the United States before, but you actually saw cattle and horses starving in the fields with their ribs sticking out, looking like pictures you see of cattle and livestock in Africa, just because there's nothing for them to eat. Hay prices are too high for farmers to buy feed for an animals. Um, and look, taking a, a longer-term perspective, the, the picture on the bottom right is the, the elevation of Lake Powell, which was one of the two big reservoirs along the Colorado River, which is the the water, the lifeblood of um, the southwestern United States and to some extent Mexico as well. Um, that reservoir was built in the 1960s, so um, it's filled up in the 1960s. It did fairly well for quite a while, and then after that famous 97, 98 El Nino that Gavin mentioned, we went down into a, we went through a climate regime shift, which has been overall drier in the southwest in the United States, and the reservoir right now is down something like 60% um, full. I mean, it did get down to much lower than that in 2002. So there's, 
um, long-term um, water supply shortages within, within the southwest. Okay, so what has actually been um, cause, has caused us to go into such a situation? Um, the drought, of course, is, you know, features also with, um, as one of these multi-billion dollar climate disasters that um, Jason mentioned. Um, Agri-crop damage, the, the, the agricultural cost of crop failure um, to the federal taxpayer, to us, of um, last year is in the sort of the $30 billion range. Um, right now. There's a lot of additional um, costs due to the drought, but it's um, combined with all the other costs of last year, it's helping make 2012 and then 2011 before it really records in terms of like um, costs of climate weather related disasters in, in the United States. Um, but if we actually go back um, to summer of 2010, for about the first time in 10 years, there was almost no drought anywhere within, uh, within the United States or North America, a few patches um, here and there. Um, but then um, what happened is that a La Nina developed in the tropical Pacific Ocean, and these, these just occur from natural interactions between the tropical Pacific atmosphere and ocean, and it's an endless ongoing cycle as... Gavin pointed out, and in the winter of 2010 to 2011, a very strong La Nina developed. That's the sea surface temperature anomaly there. I, sorry, I missed the scale, but it's about a minus two, minus three degree centigrade anomaly. Um, whenever this happens, um, it sets up a load of changes in atmospheric circulation that affect weather all over the world and in North America, in mid-latitude North America as well as mid-latitude South America, it causes drought. Um, it does various things in other parts of the world. So not surprisingly, since this developed in winter of 2010-11, by the time you got round to spring of 2011, you had a drought in the southern part of the United States that, and northern Mexico that was already looking pretty severe. And this was actually predicted well in advance. In, I remember actually giving a talk to the Western Governors Association in September of 2010 when they were very happy looking at this map and saying... Um, because operational forecast agencies were predicting that a La Nina of good strength would develop that winter, we were also predicting that a drought would develop. And um, the drought that was predicted was not as severe as the one that developed, but moving the United States and northern Mexico back into drought was well predicted months in advance. And then as it went on... Um, that La Nina continued all the way through until spring of, of last year. So this is actually a sea surface temperature averaged over all of spring 2011 to 2012. There's the cold tropical Pacific Ocean. And by the time you got into spring of last year, that drought had now spread over into the southwest of California. It has stayed there in Texas and Mexico, um, southeast of already causing a lot of trouble. And then a rather interesting thing happened because um, the La Nina went away, was replaced with warm waters in the tropical Pacific in summer of last year. However, the drought um, both intensified and extended remarkably rapidly up into the Midwest. In spring of 2012, there was almost no drought in the Midwest of the United States. By the summer of 2012, most of those regions were in extreme to exceptional drought. We have no ability to predict summer hydroclimate extremes in the United States whatsoever. So going from this drought monitor map to that drought monitor map was entirely unpredicted by every forecasting agency um, within the world. And to the extent that the, world, that the, the oceans actually went to a La El Nino, you might have thought that it might have been a little wetter in, in this region in summer of 2012, but it wasn't. Um, so there's probably um, this, um, this intensification of the drought that happened here was probably happened to be some random atmospheric event um, circulation anomaly that was added on that came on, to the, on the tail of an ocean force drought that had lasted for two years up to then. Um, okay. So, um, if we look at then this in terms of a longer term perspective, this is actually going from 1950 to 2011, and its precipitation and temperature averaged over Texas, 
um, the southern plains really, Texas and um, northern, northern Mexico, and it's just for the summers, and it's precipitation, which is the line. So first of all, there's the summer of 2011, and if, if 2012 was on here as well, it would be just as extreme or more extreme, and you can see that that was really setting um, a record since 1950 in terms of dryness. And then the air temperature is on here as well. Oh, the, actually, the air temperature is the bar and the precipitation is, is, is the line. Um, but the temperature is being turned upside down. So you, consequently, you can see that there's a very strong inverse relationship between these. When it gets um, the high temperatures that occurred in the southern, in Texas, in, in the plains during this two-year drought were because it was so dry. When the soil gets that dry, you basically, it, the, the surface has to cool by radiation or sensible heat flux, and it gets very hot. It's like comparing um, a car park to the lawn next door to it when they have the same amount of sun coming in. A bare land surface, a bare dry land surface warms up a lot more. So the record temperatures were really explained in this region by the record dryness that, that occurred at the same time. So it's the drought that caused the high temperatures. If you look at the long-term trend, there's neither a trend in, in Texas in temperature or precipitation. It really has, you know, it's not getting drier there. It's not getting hotter there. This is one of the few places in the world where, which hasn't actually warmed up over the 20th century, um, Texas. So... Um, most, so pretty much, I think, for, to, in order to explain the extreme event that we are still going through um, within the, the drought in the United States, um, it is, just go back, it is um, almost ent entirely caused by just the natural variability of the atmosphere and ocean system. Um, the record-breaking temperatures themselves probably do get a little bit of a, an add-on effect from like there being some background global warming, but even they are primarily due to this um, natural variability going on. Which is not to say that um, hydro hydrological changes due to um, what we are, how we are changing the composition of the atmosphere are not important. They actually are, of course, very important. Um, as well, and this is roughly what we expect to happen. Um, greenhouse, greenhouse warming will impact patterns of precipitation, less evaporation. So that's the, the term, that's the quantity that we tend to use for this because it's the net flux of water at the surface of the Earth. And it'll impact these patterns across the planet. Right now, um, this is model simulations um, of the P minus E distribution that we have in, in the 20th century, and we have positive values near the equator, so precipitations and excessive evaporation where you have very strong tropical rain bands, and also in middle latitudes like where we are, we have excessive precipitation over evaporation. And then in the subtropics, where all your deserts are, um, you have negative values of this. In other words, the precipitation is less than the evaporation. These are all the places where it dry, where there's very little um, precipitation. And the reason there is that distribution is because the atmosphere moves moisture around. So the arrows here are low-level winds, and you can see wherever the, the winds, here they are, the trade winds, wherever they converge, they bring moisture there, it rains a lot, the precipitation exceeds the evaporation. And in these subtropical regions, you can see they, they lie in between the trades flowing towards the equator and westerlies flowing away from the subtropics. So these are regions of moisture divergence, and they tend to be dry. What happens when you increase the temperature of the, of the air due to increasing greenhouse gases, the air, through pure thermodynamics, can hold more moisture. So consequently, this movement of moisture by the winds in the atmosphere intensifies. And that just makes the hydrological variations more extreme. So it makes the dry areas drier and it makes the wet areas wetter. So you can see how well the change in P minus E in these model simulations for the next two decades relative to the late 20th century, you can see how well that change maps onto the existing distribution where places that were already wet get wetter and places that were already dry, including Mexico, southwest U.S., Mediterranean region, um, get drier as well. And it's a little harder to see on the picture there, but in addition to extremes getting more extreme in place, you actually find that these subtropical dry zones expand. They both expand towards the equator, and they expand towards the higher latitudes. 
as well. And that's because there are some additional changes in atmospheric circulation that increase in greenhouse gas has caused too. Um, looking at that over North America, this is what um, the models predicted the last time we did this in 2007 with the, the models that were used for the IPCC assessment report 4. This is what the models which are being used for IPCC assessment report 5, which will be published next year or in 2015, um, uh, are producing. So after, you know, years and years more of com running computer models of um, vast complexity and sucking up much of the world's computing resources, we've come back to exactly the same result that um, didn't really change that very much. But you can see that um, for winter half years and summer half years, um, the southwestern part of the United States, including Texas, uh, Mexico gets drier. And in the summer part of the half year, that drying is mostly over the central to northern parts of the United States, including um, the major agricultural producing region there um, within the Midwest. This is almost certainly going to have some fairly serious impacts on agriculture, water resources, and of course um, the landscape in the ecosystem, natural ecosystems, forests and so on are going to have to adapt to this, which is going to be quite a problem for, say, southwestern forests. Okay. Um, in the, most mod in the most recent run um, simulations, you can do things like try to compute what it means, say, for the runoff of the Colorado River. And we have done that. And this is, a, a, um, this is the boxes here. It's percent change in Colorado River runoff by season and by the annual mean. And the, the spread of all the different models, there was something like 20-something climate models that were analyzed in this, multiple runs of different models. So you get different numbers depending on, on all of those. But they seem to come out that in the annual mean, there's about the best estimate would be about a 10% reduction in Colorado River runoff. This is actually for 2021 to 2040. Um, and you can compare that with um, long tree ring based reconstructions of Colorado River flow that we have that go back to 800. And there were a whole load of mega droughts that occurred in the medieval period that we know had very, very serious impacts on the landscape um, at the time. And those droughts themselves were also about 10, 15% reductions, as were associated with 10, 15% reductions in Colorado um, river, river flow. Um, so the anthropogenic change that is being induced in the river flow within the next two decade period, so that's really the near term future, is, is of the same amplitude as what can happen due to natural variability of the climate system on multi-decadal timescales. The difference, of course, is that when the, when the natural climate system does this, it does it for a few decades and then stops and does something else. Um, but what the humans are doing to the climate change, this is induced by rising greenhouse gases, this 10% reduction, and it will go on as long, as long as we keep the CO2 up in the atmosphere. So it's, not, it's a permanent change, which, and so that's, it's that permanence that means that it's something unlike what we would ever see before. And the whole landscape and ecosystem of this region is going to have to make some rather drastic adjustment to that increasing aridity. Um, it's so, but nonetheless, if you go back to what I said about the ongoing Texas drought, the natural variability in, in the southwest of the U.S. is so large that it's hard to clearly detect that that change is already happening. And we've tried to detect whether these changes are happening in other regions of the world as well, in Africa, um, South America, and so on. And it's the, the, the climate variability is of such high amplitude that it's generally rather difficult to find, although we do think that, this is, that the, these human-induced changes are, are occurring. But there is one region in the world where it seems almost unambiguous that human-induced hydrological change is already occurring, and that's the Mediterranean. The late... Um, latter part of the 20th century had a rather serious drying across the entire um, Mediterranean region. This has been reversed in much of the Mediterranean in recent, in recent years, but not in, in the Middle East region. And we've done some work where we try to um, separate out that trend into a part that is due to natural variability. And that part is, almost, is largely controlled by an atmospheric circulation phenomenon 
called the North Atlantic Oscillation, which some of you may have heard of, which has impressively long ability to vary on decade timescales. And it went through its own trend um, within the late 1990s. It trended towards a positive state, which you know, moves the storm tracks over the North Atlantic and so on. And you know, whatever it, however it works, it makes the Mediterranean dry. And much of this trend that occurred was due to this just trend in the natural, natural trend due to natural variability of the North Atlantic Oscillation. But we were unable to explain the drying that occurred in the Middle Eastern region and to some extent over in um, Morocco and southern Spain due to that trend in the natural variability of the atmosphere. And instead, this part in the Middle East we could only explain in terms of a rise in greenhouse gases. And it was very, this, although this was an entirely observational analysis, climate models predict that this region should have been getting drier and will continue to, to get drier. And while we focused on this very strong drying trend with this period, if you extend this analysis up to 2012, um, you still get the, um, the Middle Eastern region drying can only be explained in terms of rising greenhouse gases. That has proven to be highly important in recent years because it seems to have been implicated in some of the um, unrest there in, in, in Syria with ag agricultural collapse in the regions of northern Syria induced by this drought and a couple of think tanks, think tanks prepared a big report about that that they released um, last week and that may well turn out to be a case where climate change, human-induced climate change is clearly translating through to um, social revolution. Okay, um, just um, one other thing to think about, which is what I was talking there was changes in mean precipitation. Um, climate change also um, impacts precipitation extremes. So this is um, a plot of by latitude of the amount of um, precipitation that occurs in the heaviest 0.1% of events. Um, so one of these lines here is observations of that, and the other one is climate model simulations of the late 20th century. And then the red one here is, is a simulation of the same quantity in t at the end of the 21st century. So the climate models predict that pretty much everywhere the heaviest 1% of precipitation events will have significantly more rainfall within them than they did in, in, in the 20th century. Um, this has actually been observed over a lot of places, and, um, including in the United States, from rain gauge records, where um, this, is, this is a time series from 1900 to 20, 2000 or so of the amount of precipitate, the, the precipitation within the heaviest 1% of events or the heaviest 0.1% of events. And you see it moves along and then it jumps up in the late um, 20, 20th century. And the same scientists have done this analysis in other parts of the world and found that this, is, that this is an observed change, that more of our rainfall is falling in the very heaviest precipitation events, separated out by drier, longer dry spells in between. And it, um, the explanation for this is really the same as the explanation for the mean change in the hydrological cycle, which is the water vapor in the atmosphere goes up. Um, when the water vapor in the atmosphere goes up, any existing storm system can draw on more moisture, and it can rain out more moisture when, it, when, it, um, when, when, it, when atmospheric conditions are prone to producing precipitation. So you just put more moisture in the atmosphere, you are going to get more of these extreme precipitation events. This is a, a, a map of the change in lower level moisture in percent. It's like 14, 15, 20 percent. Um, and here's a, this is for the early, 20th, early 21st century, and then this is actually a map of the, of the change in the variance of P minus E, annual mean variance in this case, and you can see that goes up pretty much everywhere, apart from some of those regions where the mean precipitation is going to go down, including the southwest US and Mexico, where it seems actually variance will go down because actually the mean precipitation is going down and there isn't that much of an increase in, there isn't such a high increase in moisture within those, within those regions. Okay, so to conclude, um, any extreme events that happen, they almost always arise from natural climate variability. So for example, North American droughts that are produced by La Nina events or atmospheric blocking events that cause intense drying heat. The summer heat wave in 2003 in Europe would be one of those. Or March, if you remember last year, we had 20 degree 
March last year, we had 20 degrees um, temperature anomalies in Chicago and the Midwest. That, again, was due to a blocking event, um, which is all due to natural climate variability. But the, the way that the climate change comes in is that when you have these extremes that come about from natural variability, climate change can make those extremes become even more extreme. So if you're in a region where um, climate change is causing drier conditions to emerge, um, droughts will just become more severe. And when you have wet times, they won't be as wet as they other would be. Would be. In addition, rising temperatures by increasing the atmospheric water vapor holding capacity, sucking more moisture out of soils um, and out of vegetation and reducing soil moisture and, and stream flow. That's just going to be happening everywhere. So you have the, the rising temperatures creating water stress, even if you aren't going into a, even if you're not in a place where the precipitation is going to go down. And then the other consequence of rising atmospheric humidity, which is just a consequence of warming, is that it will always intensify water vapor transports. Now, anywhere where it rains, it's because moisture is being moved into that region by the atmosphere. So you're always going to be moving more moisture in because the atmosphere is holding more, and that can increase extremes of precipitation on all time scales, on the, day, on the hourly time scale, the daily time scale, the annual mean time scale. This just occurs on all, all time scales. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, so now uh, we've got about half an hour left, and we can uh, we can have some questions and some discussion. Uh, this is just a technical question. How do you uh, how do people get data on those remote parts of the Pacific Ocean? Like, where are you getting those temperatures from, basically? It's for me or at any of you? Um, you get that yeah. Well, I mean, these now nowadays a lot of them come from satellite observations, but historically they came from ship observations, which. Um, Ship observations uh, were routinized beginning in 1856 by the European and American navies. So now it's augmented by satellites, and also we have all sorts of other buoys out there and so on. So that data's, uh, that data's pretty good. And girls? I think you said boys, <laughs> right? <laughs> Hi. Um, in the year 2006, Al Gore warned that we had a 10-year window to make changes before climate change becomes irreversible. Do you think that was um, an alarmist claim, or do you agree with him? Um, so for all intents and purposes, climate change is irreversible. I mean, we've already passed that point. When we're not going to see a climate like the, the, the 1950s, again, no, none of us are going to see that. Um, what we've done to, uh, to, to Arctic ice, uh, for instance, we're not going to not going to recover that. So, uh, the the time scales that politicians use when they say these kinds of things, we have four years stacked, we have ten years stacked. What 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 they're trying to to express is that there's a lot of inertia in the system, right? Uh, we haven't caught up. The climate hasn't caught up with uh, things we put into the atmosphere ten or twenty years ago, right? So right now we're storing up problems because the planet as a whole is, is, you know, is still catching up. And if we keep moving the goalposts, right, the planet has more to catch up to. So when you when you go forward with those projections and you say, okay, well, how long does it take to, you know, rearrange your energy supply? How long does it take to, you know, change all the things that we're doing that are contributing to this? Uh, it's a, it's a long time, right? It's it's. 20, 30, 40, 50 years for all of that infrastructure to get changed, adapted, uh, you know, replaced. Um, and so if you don't start soon, then what you end up with is, is, you, is you, you're building in emissions into the system that, you know, in 10 years' time we'll be stuck with, right? And so the more that we invest in, you know, fossil fuel delivery systems and infrastructure that relies on fossil fuels particularly, uh, then you know we're just building in more and more emissions for the future, and so a larger and larger impact uh, by the time we get out to 2030, 2050, you know, 2100. Um, so it's not that anything terrible is going to particularly happen in 2016 or 2014 or something. I mean, I'm sure terrible things will happen in those years, but I don't think they'll be related to anything Al Gore was talking about. Uh, but you know there there is a there's a time scale for 
um, for, for, for policies that, that are needed in order to prevent like, much, much larger changes going on in the future. And, and that's, that's really the problem here. The problem is, if, if it was, if it was a, a, a thing that, well, we have to act now because there's something terrible going to happen tomorrow, right, then people would do it. It would be an acute problem. It would be like the asteroid coming and it's going to destroy us. Okay, we would mobilize. We would do everything in our power to stop that happening. But what we're talking about here is, is much more of a chronic problem, right? Uh, it's something that is going to get worse and worse and worse and worse, but every year it's just going to get a little bit more worse. Right? I, 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 I think the other challenge, you know, there, there's often discussions about dangerous levels of carbon dioxide, and sometimes these discussions are couched in that, and people talk about 350, 450, what's a, what's a threshold that we should be um, targeting? And I think it's useful to think about targets as, as uh, spurring actions, but the other thing that is difficult to quantify, and I think one of the reasons why this is a, a really difficult question is, there are parts of the climate system that work like dials, so as we turn up the CO2, we could potentially go back to where we were if we turned it back down, and there are a lot of things that work like thresholds. And so one of the you know, scary things about understanding what dangerous levels of CO2 might be is quantifying those thresholds. We know there are feedbacks in the climate system that once we, we pass a certain threshold, no matter what we do, we're going to be on a trajectory where the climate system takes over and, and may go into a completely different state. The problem is, is it's very hard to predict where those thresholds lie. And so there's certainly a conservative principle that I think we should all apply, which is we don't, I think we can all agree, we don't want to go past some of these thresholds, like melting enough permafrost where we start emitting enough um, methane into the atmosphere that you know all of a sudden that signal becomes significant, or where we melt uh, the ice caps back far enough where regardless of what happens, they will continue to melt because of the feedbacks involved there. And so you know, this issue of thresholds is one of the things that we have the least uh, that we have our fingers on the least in terms of quantifying and understanding where exactly those might be, but they could uh, be some of the largest impacts, and we just don't know where we cross those in the climate system at this point. We know they exist, but we don't know exactly where the CO2 level is that would put us past those. My understanding is that there are some uh, effects that are like multipliers and basically become vicious circles, like for example the warming of the oceans and things like that. Can, can you talk about those things where they actually just compound and they're pretty much unstoppable? Kind of like going back to the previous question, but specifically I guess talking about the oceans when they warm up, what effects they have with the reflection of the heat and all that. Well, I'll give you just a couple of quick examples and, and the rest of the panel can weigh in. One of the, so these are feedbacks is what we're talking about, and there can be positive or negative feedbacks, things that either enhance the degree of change or feedback to reduce the degree of change. And a couple of positive feedbacks that we think about are the, what we call the isobito feedback. So as we melt uh, ice in the polar regions, that, when it's there, acts like a big mirror. So it reflects a lot of the incoming sunlight, and as a result, we don't absorb that uh, energy, and, and that energy then isn't used to warm the planet. Uh, when we melt the ice and replace it with dark ocean waters, we now absorb a lot more of that uh, incident solar energy and as a result enhance the warming uh, that occurs. So that's one. Clouds are another big question. Clouds can actually be work as positive or negative feedbacks and one of the challenges is that they're some of the hardest things to model in the climate system and you know there's been a lot of research uh, done in how to incorporate cloud changes into climate models and, and how they might uh, change into the future. Uh, but to be honest, that's one of the areas that we still don't have a complete understanding of how clouds will change. And I should say, they, the way they work is they can reflect more sunlight. So depending on the kinds of clouds you have, you might reflect more sunlight if you're forming more clouds into a warming planet. Uh, but they also can absorb long wave radiation and work to, to further warm the planet. And so the balance of that moving forward is something that we're still working out. Do you guys want to add to feedbacks? Um, yeah, so I mean, there's, there's lots of these, these different kind of amplifying factors. Um, you mentioned a couple, there's, there's, a, there's a few more that, that you could discuss. I think it's important to remember, though, that this isn't the same as, uh, you know, something going completely out of control, like, like, a, like a feedback on a, on a mic or something. We're not, you know, you, these things it, it, uh, amplify the change, but they don't take it into some huge new state. We're not going to end up... Uh, living on planet Venus, at least, you know, not for another five billion years or so. So, you know, these amplifiers get talked about a lot, like the methane uh, from permafrost gets talked about a lot, uh, but 
it would really need to warm a lot before we thought that that was going to be a big player in what's happening. I mean, there are carbon cycle feedbacks, so you know, uh, as the temperatures warm, it's harder to dissolve carbon dioxide in the ocean, and that's where it's all going to end up eventually. Uh, and so that leaves more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, so that's a, a slight amplifier. But you know, they're part of the system, uh, and, and we need to be paying attention to them. But they're not—they're not the difference between us being here and then us going off like that. I mean, all of those things that you're seeing, the trends that you're seeing, all of those include a certain degree of amplification from the factors that we've already talked about. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the feedbacks related to sea ice, water vapor, clouds, you know, are of course within the climate models whose results we were presenting from today. So the methane one, the carbon cycle feedbacks, pro probably aren't, but the, all the feedbacks that we consider to be the most important are in there. So they aren't, none of them are causing a runaway situation. Uh, you displayed a, a graph of the Canadian uh, temperature changes that was hiding data. Was it a political graph or is it um, reflecting the fact that the, in Canada it's a very conservative government and they're trying to promote tar sands and pipelines uh, and such? Or is it? So that was in the National Post. If you, if you know oh. the National Post, it, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's a kind of Wall Street Journal one to me. Um, uh, along with their, the Wall Street Journal's peculiar take on the, the, the world from their op-ed page. So, so they're trying to have their own peculiar take. So it, it's very much a political newspaper, um, uh, but always has been. Uh, and it's not related particularly to the current Canadian government's uh, stances, though I'm sure that they support that. <laughs> Okay, we're done. So that was good. The, uh, the whole uh, climate change uh, issue uh, dealt with and, uh, and tidied up. Um, did you, did you want to say anything? Do you have any comments on anybody else's presentation? Or, or do you want to release these poor folks back into the wild? Well, I'm sure someone else has some. I'm sure someone else has some questions. Come on. Yeah. What are you always wanted to ask the climate scientists. <laughs> Perhaps this is overly general a question, um, but as a layperson kind of coming into, let's say, a conference like this or reading Conrad Black's lovely newspaper, um, sometimes I feel a little bit lost between what's um, a modest estimate, a conservative estimate. Is there anything that functions as essentially um, a normal case scenario scoreboard for how we're doing as a species in custody of our planet? That's a great idea. Uh, we should have such a thing. I don't think such a thing exists, but you're absolutely right. I mean, like, you know, what's conservative, what's normal, what's expected. These things change day by day, and, and when people use these words, you often have no idea what they actually mean. Um, so, having a, a quantified thing where you can actually say exactly what these things mean uh, and how you do it, I think would be great. I interpreted your question a little bit differently, which is, you know, where do you go for um, information that might be sort of middle of the road or whatever? Right. Oh, okay. Well, that's not <laughs> I mean, it, that's a really, uh, you know, in today's day and age, there's information everywhere, and you can pull things up the yeah, head uh, with impunity, and, and so it is important to think about where you get your information. I think as a scientific community, uh, first of all, a lot of scientists work, uh, Gavin is a good example of someone who works uh, to communicate. Uh, his knowledge as a scientist to the lay public for things like blogs. But I think you know one of the best bets is to go to um, agencies and organizations where what their their findings represent is a broad consensus within the scientific community. And you know, I mentioned the IPCC. Uh, a lot of us think of some of the things that the IPCC reports as conservative. If you imagine trying to get 2,000 scientists to agree on certain points, you might imagine that they can agree on certain things that are unassailable and other things that they leave as still uh, being discussed. So one of the examples of that was in the 2007 report when they reported on uh, sea level rise. And at the time, there were a lot of uh, things that were emerging about the dynamics of ice sheets and how they melt under global warming scenarios. But it was still research that was being worked out and refined. And, and what uh, the, the report and what the scientists decided to do was only report on the sea level rise associated with uh, the expansion due to the, the warming of the oceans to mention the fact that these dynamic features were out there, but not include them in their official uh, sea level rise estimate. 
And that's a very clear example of a situation where what was reported was a very conservative projection of what the sea level rise was expected to be. Uh, and the science since that time has evolved and matured, and it's been revised upwards by 50 to 100 percent. So the sea level rise projections at that point uh, were conservative. The point being is that I think that when, uh, if you really want the consensus view, go to the scientific organizations, go to the IPCC, these places where they represent a broad consensus of the scientific community, and put less weight on individual opinions and, and uh, reporting, because I think that you know everyone has a perspective, but it's it's very important to build consensus. Uh, I, I was just going to add the, the National Academies uh, do a really good job of that kind of stuff. So so don't read what you don't don't believe what you read on my blog, but but read what the National Academies say. They do they do really good job. I'm the same for you that I talk regarding um, the increase in desertification and has also increased the climate and increased, increased the weather. Um, and I was just wondering your take on that, like if we increase grasslands, like could, do you really believe that has a change in, in climate? There's not an awful lot of evidence that modification of the land surface causes a significantly strong effect on the climate above it. Um, there are a few exceptions. The dust bowl is one, which was one of the, you know, so the United States in the 1930s was one of the most significant human-induced perturbations of the land surface that has ever occurred. And it seems to have had a clear intensification of the drought. But the more commonly asserted one is the Sahel of um, Africa, the, the, the southern shore of the Sahara Desert, where the whole idea of desertification was originally induced by an eminent MIT meteorologist, Jules Charney. Um, it, we now know that that doesn't seem to have really had um, the, the, the impact of grazing and transformation of the savannah region there by farmers and, and um, her, people herding um, livestock doesn't seem to have had a significant effect. And in fact, that's a region where there was a, a trend towards drier conditions from the 60s through to the 90s, and it's now been largely reversed and people have moved back. Um, the landscape there, the vegetation, seems to be able to respond remarkably quickly to changes in, in precipitation. So um, land surface changes and impacts on the atmosphere, it's still something that is, is being looked at a lot, uh, relative to say the influence that ocean conditions have on climates around the world, I would say it's small, and I can tell Gavin's itching to disagree with Well, no, 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 I disagree completely. Um, I, mean, I, I think you're right, the, 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 the savannah margins, like the, you know, planting grasses and the rain following the grass, and, uh, that, that I agree is, is not, uh, it, it, it's, it's not very much but, but by large scale deforestation in the Amazon, uh, that does have an impact. It has an impact on the wood recycling, it has an impact on the rainfall. Uh, the deforestation in Europe that occurred mainly you know, in the, uh, now many hundreds of years ago uh, had an impact on climate. The uh, deforestation of the, of the uh, US and the reforestation after the population crash in Columbus, uh, after, after Columbus discovered um, uh, Hispaniola, uh, those things did have impacts on, on climate. Uh, they're there, they're detectable, um, but in terms of like how big they are uh, compared to the changes that we're seeing because of greenhouse gases, uh, it's it's. I mean, it's interestingly, it's interesting scientifically, um, but of uh, kind of second order in terms of where we're going. Um, I think there's a vast population of our uh, leadership global and national. At a vast population of uh, uh, global and national constituents who simply don't understand this. Um, today's analogy to baseball is like a mind opener because it's a handy implement for informing the public at large. It would be very nice to engage our public to become part of the future in this particular way. Perhaps it would help. So, uh, absolutely. Um, that, that analogy, actually, the, uh, the weather on steroids, um, actually gets a lot of play in the press uh, the last few months. Um, and, and you're right, it is, 
know, people, people will understand these things uh, when you speak in terms of uh, metaphors uh, that are appropriate uh, quite handily. I think the bigger problem that we have in, in talking to the public, though, is that the public have lots of other things in their mind. Yeah. You know, they're, they're worrying about their paycheck, they're worrying about unemployment, their health benefits, you know, their house, which has been flooded. You know. There's uh, there's a lot of demands on people's attention. You know what? What are the, what are the Kardashians doing today? <laughs> That's very cool. um, so you know, they're not as interesting as that in some sense. Um, I think they're more important. This issue is more important. Um, but uh, you know, the people don't always want to be thinking about important things. Uh, and so finding ways to to break through into people's kind of self-imposed bubbles. Uh, is, is, is tough. You could call it brand new issue. Yeah, but then you get accused of propagandizing and then you just get, you know, then that, that undermines your credibility as a scientist. So there's only so much you can do there. But, you know, people are trying in all sorts of different ways. I mean, I'm certainly doing my best and, and these guys are doing their best and, and lots of other people in the community are also. Uh, Doing a lot more in terms of at all different levels, at the, the city level, at the public level, at church levels, um, federal government level. Um, we're making we're making progress, but it's slow and it isn't. Um, I, I would put it um, slightly differently to the way you did, because I think you know the public is, um, if anything, you know more concerned and aware of concerned these issues than government leaders are. Um, these federal level government leaders are. So, um, but the when you look at um, when you ask people whether they believe global warming is real or whether humans are responsible for it, the responses come back and they are completely predictable based on ideological lines. It's you know it's an overwhelming uh, majority in the US. No, in the US. It's not in, the, in the US. It's, a, it's an overwhelming majority of people who vote Democratic and it's a minority of people who vote Republican. So and. The Republicans actually tend to have higher levels of education than, than, than Democrats, actually, because they're wealthier. Um, so it doesn't, whether people believe in global warming and look at the scientific evidence and think it's something of concern and something that humans are responsible for has no correlation with their education level whatsoever. So what people are believing is being dictated a priori by what they want the answer to. And, you know, science, climate science is not the only thing like that. Economics is another one. Um, and so I think it's, you know, just knowledge transfer is in and of itself, and explaining the science in and of itself is not going to get us to a solution. I think we all have our opinions on this. I agree with everything that's been said. I also think it's um, not entirely accurate to think about this as a vacuum where if Scientists would just step forward to fill it, it would uh, solve the problem, and whether it's through different ways of communication. I, we all have um, you know, work to do to think about how to communicate our science more effectively to the lay public, and I'm in complete support with that. But you know, the, the, the fact is that it's not a vacuum, there's actually a lot of noise out there. It's not just the Kardashians, there's a lot of uh, noise with regard to um, the way people look at the actual science. And Gavin showed some good examples of figures that were misleading, and I think that. What exists out there in terms of uh, confusion, and, and the gentleman that asked about where do I go for, uh, you know, appropriately sourced information? It's a really hard task to actually establish um, to cut through the noise with the principal message about what we know, what we understand, and what the threats are. And so I wouldn't excuse us from having a big job to do, and I think that we absolutely have to engage. But I think we also have to acknowledge that. There are a lot of other things, either randomly or by design, uh, that make our message, in some cases, difficult to get out because of how much uh, noise and argument there is out there uh, by people who are really doing it honestly. The central issue is that the vast population is simply scientifically illiterate. And uh, I remember years ago, the Federal Reserve Bank 
the drought, okay. uh, that the drought cost taxpayers thirty billion dollars. Right? Yeah, something like that. Uh, where my question is, where did those dollars go? Are they just subsidizing farmers' losses, or like, basically where does that money go? And two, who's bearing the brunt of yeah. uh, those crop yields decreasing? Basically, like no one's going hungry in the first world country, but like where does that money go? Well, no one goes hungry. Not many people go hungry in the United States, but there was a, there was a huge um, drop in crop production within the United States in 2011, and then last year in 2012. I, I could there was a lot of that. I mean, it's a remarkable outlier. Um, the amount of lost production for corn in 2012 was equivalent to the total U.S. production in around about 1960. So it's, um, it was a lot. And there's a system of federal, federally backed crop insurance that farmers buy into, and there's a payout for that. However, there's not enough money went into it to be able to pay out this, and that's always the case. So the tab just falls on the, the federal tax bill, the tax payers. So that's what, how that money, and it just goes directly to, to farmers. So farmers within the United States will often see, will not see much of a drop in farm income during a drought when their crops fail because the lost income is compensated for by federal payouts. Um, and you can argue whether that's a good system or a bad system, but it's the, the way it's the way that it has um, worked here for for back. I mean, this is a system that was initially set up after the 1930s dust bowl drought, which in many ways was like a bifurcation point in the social and economic history of the much of the US agricultural production. Hi there, guys. Um, I have a, a question. It's not necessarily my viewpoint, but it's one that I did read about, and I'm just curious if, since we have three esteemed climate scientists here, what your opinions might be on oh, this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say, that I'm, uh, <laughs> let's say that I'm someone that, that yes, I agree with all this, but so what? I think that 100 years from now we'll just adapt, migrate, more people live in the northern latitudes, and generally I think that everyone will just be slightly better off in a warmer planet. What, what's, the, what's the response to something like that from the experts? So if we, if we were starting out and we, and we had our whole um, civilization to build again, and the world was going to have the climate that, that we anticipate in 2100, we would make different decisions. We would, uh, we would not put quite so much infrastructure uh, near the waterline. Uh, we, would, uh, we would have adjusted where we're growing grapes and corn and, uh, and tilling soils and chopping down forests and all of these things. And, you know, we could pretty much go on the way we really were. But that's not the situation. The situation is not whether a warmer climate is intrinsically better than a colder climate. We, you're right, we would, we would just adapt to that. The problem is that we've invested in the climate that we have. We've invested trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars in anticipation of where the shoreline is. Right? And, and we saw that very clearly with, with Sandy and Katrina. Um, we have invested very heavily in the kinds of houses that we build in certain climates, the, certain, the kinds of heating systems and air conditioning systems the kinds of crop services that we have. Um, uh, all of these things exist because we had a climate that allowed these things to exist. They were based on expectations that that climate was not going to change very much. Those expectations are changing. And that's why we have a problem. Because moving to that mythical world where we're totally happy in a four degree, five degree warmed world is not going to be free, right? Uh, ask Bloomberg uh, how much the costs of a barrage across the, uh, across the Arizona Barrows is going to be. Uh, ask the people on the other side of that barrage whether they want that to be there because every time there's a flood, it's going to make their floods worse even while it's sinking on and happening. Uh, ask the Venetians how much the Moe's project is ask the, ba the Bangladeshis what they're going to do because they're not going to build a barrage. Um, you know, where are the you know, 100 million people that live within one meter of sea level going to move to? 
and there's um, that's a lot of people, and in parts of the world that are not necessarily the most open and friendly um, and welcoming to literally hordes of newcomers. So I, the, the cost of this, the issue here, is, is not you know how can we get as fast to the sunny uplands that, that one might imagine uh, as possible, but but what that transition is going to be, and, and who's going to be suffering there what the consequences there is for our cultural heritage, for our, for our human capital, uh, for all sorts of, uh, of things along those lines. Um, I, I would add that um, the, obviously a country like the United States or Western Europe, wealthy countries are going to be able to, to some extent, adjust. You know, there are engineering solutions to, um, to, to, a, lot, to a lot of this. Um, but the impacts of climate change are not geographically spread equally. Um, so um, Jason showed the, the maps of future temperatures in Africa, for example, and that came from a study, the, one of many studies about you know, how is it that tropical agriculture is going to adapt to temperatures that high. You can't breed crops for temperatures that they have never seen in their whole history of evolution. That's very difficult to do. So there's a real threat of, for example, serious declines in tropical agricultural productivity. Now, Africans have done nothing to create this problem, but will be amongst the people who are, you know, getting, who are going to experience the most severe consequences. And similarly, when you look at the changes in hydroclimate and the aridification of the Middle East or Northern Africa, um, some of those places will probably become uninhabitable because of dry, because of drying and depletion of water resources. And right now, we uh, in, live in a world where migration from those countries to the, the better able to adapt climate countries in more northern latitudes is already restricted. And I don't see anything changing that is going to allow an extra several million climate refugees be able to migrate out of the, the countries that have suffered the worst consequences of, of human activities that they have nothing to do with. So um, that's certainly not, a, I mean, that may be the world that we are going to, but uh, I, I certainly don't think it's something that I look forward to at all. And our last word. I'm going to take the last word. I just want to, you know, the thing I think about this, as far as this goes is, think of a mountain, think of the species that have adapted in different bands of the mountain. If you're the species at the top of the mountain where you've adapted to a certain number of, uh, a certain amount of cold temperatures and precipitation, and things warm, the snow line moves up, and the temperatures increase. If you're at the top of the mountain, it's not a good place to be because you don't have anywhere else to go. And that's what exists for a lot of uh, people throughout the world as the world warms and what they're going to be able to adjust to, whether it's through sea level rises or changes in temperatures, etc. The other thing, so in some senses, it's a, it's a privileged position to make that argument because if you have adaptation um, capabilities, uh, yeah, chances are you will adapt uh, to some degree and, and make those adaptations in a way that will uh, mitigate or at least reduce the impacts that you uh, experience. But I think that you can also make the argument from a privileged position just by doing a cost-benefit analysis, just by looking, looking at the risks we face and the options that we have in front of us. Yes, we can uh, you know, put the throttle forward, just speed on uh, in the direction that we're going, and we may get there, which might be a problem uh, by virtue of the fact that we will suffer a lot of the um, impacts if we continue going in this direction. Some of the other options are not just about mitigating this problem, but also mean cleaner energies, more uh, equitable energies, more resilient um, infrastructures to many of the different uh, climatic changes that exist just through internal variability. And so I think when you actually add those things up and you look at the risks and the things that we face in addition to what we can actually achieve if we if we made sensible responses to this, both in reducing our emissions and uh, finding additional energy supplies and, and taking advantage of those. I think by far, even from a privileged position, it makes a lot more sense to take this risk seriously and uh, build smartly and, and, and invest in alternatives. Okay, um, we have to wrap it up now. Uh, but thank you very much for coming. Uh, uh, having these interactions at the end of it uh, is actually uh, far more interesting for us than uh, giving our own opinions again and again and again. So thank you very much for that. Um, and, uh, and I uh, wish you uh, all the best, and uh, maybe we'll see you at the next uh, one of these uh, seminars. Uh, what was that? April 4th. April 4th. Okay, thank you very much.